so much into neuroinformatics. So uh, this is one problem I have. And the other problem I have is that I'm going to talk about a system that is not that much covered by uh, the neuroinformatics uh, community. And in fact, when Gordon Shepard showed his wonderful databases, I realized that the cell times I'm working on weren't even included. Well, actually, the region I'm working on wasn't even included in the cell types. So um, I will take this opportunity then today, my so-called 22 minutes of fame, to try to convince you that there is much more beyond the cortex and much more beyond the cortical processing of sensory information that might be uh, considered if we want to understand brains and behavior. So I'm going to talk about the midbrain, the vertebrate midbrain, mostly the midbrain of birds, because this is what I'm working on, but I will relate also to some mammalian studies. Self-circuit concept, so I will first talk about the role of the midbrain in behavior, then I will shortly introduce the anatomy and connectivity of the visual midbrain, and then describe a feedback loop in the midbrain, the tectoisthmic network that has received a lot of attention recently, uh, especially because Eric Knudsen has picked up that uh, subject in the Barnall. And I will try to convince you that it might be relevant for a lot of the things that have, are going on in the cortex as well. So I will rather talk about the concepts behind it and not so much give you data on uh, the system because I am convinced that most of you are not familiar with the system so I don't want to flood you with a lot of uh, anatomical and physiological data in that respect. Okay, so uh, as Carl already pointed out, uh, an essential thing for behaving systems is that information is not a passive thing that is uh, impinging on them, but they're actually actively looking for information. And especially in the visual system, it used to be that you know, brains were regarded as more or less passive analyses of uh, what is going, uh, coming in from the retina. Well, in fact, it's uh, rather depicted in that image. Uh, animals and brains are constantly updating, constantly searching for information, constantly looking around and trying to, well, analyze the most important feature and object that is around. And this is important for survival, as I will show you in a few seconds. Um, it is even more difficult because for many animals, the, the image that you see at a given point in time is not like this, but it's rather like that. And we all know this because we have a phobia retina. So the area that is actually in good focus and is in, you know, can give you a lot of data is very small, much smaller even than this. So what we of course do is we look around. So we have to gather the contents of our surrounding by looking around, by making saccades, and we all know that. But in fact, it's often neglected if we look at how people try to analyze visual processing. So we look around, and this is easy to do. This is easy to do if we know what we're looking at. So for example, if you look at a face, and you probably all know that face, if we look at a face, we exactly know where to put our eyes on, where to put our phobia on. And this is just depicted here, so it's mostly in the eyes and in the mouth, and especially, you know, this is the area of the face where we know that information will come from, which is relevant for us. However, if we look at something that we do not know, or we have no concept of, where do we then put our eyes? And the next picture I'm going to show you is, is one of these pictures that probably most of you know, but if not, you might experience that you will kind of frantically search around for a concept of what you're looking at. Okay, here it is. Okay, well, most of you probably know it, but those who do not, this is a Dalmatian dog. And if you do no, not know what there is, okay, you will have a hard time and you will kind of frantically look around trying to make out what is there. Okay, and this is very relevant for survival. And um, the question where to look uh, has certainly driven evolution. Uh, and this is the last introductory slide I'm going to show you. So I'm going to play a game with you. So I will show you that picture. And as soon as you say, or as soon as you think you see something that is relevant for your survival, please raise your hand. So three, two, one, go. One, two, three. Okay, I see a lot of you would probably not survive in the wild. <laughs> okay, um, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like an arms race in nature, right? I mean, of course, the predator tries to not be seen, right? Okay, but you will, I think, agree that it's important to see these kinds of things. So in order to put our distant senses onto that important issues or on that important objects, we have to answer the basic question, and this is, how can we look at the most important object when we do not know where and what it is? 
and especially if our surround and the non-foveal region of our retina is such lowly resolved and actually lacks color in our lab. Okay, so how do we do that? And we do it by um, making use of mechanisms that extract basic information in our non-foveal surround, which is motion signals, looming signals, something on the collision course towards you, strong color and, and contrast, and of course also uh, non-visual cues like touch and sound. So for example, if that wolf would have moved and something would have you know, sounded, you would immediately have looked there. Okay, and this is what I'm actually interested in, and this is something that is going on not in the cortex, but at least to a great degree in the midbrain, in the midbrain of animals. And this is why the title of my talk, oh well, actually the real title of my talk is Multimodal uh, Bottom-Up Mechanism in the Midbrain of Birds. Now why do I do it in birds? The reason is that in birds the system is um, from a, well, analysis, uh, analysis, uh, analysis point of view, very um, nicely laid out. If we look at the midbrain, here depicted in blue, this is the optic tectum. If we section that, we have the structure like this. It's very large in birds. And you can even see with the naked eye that you have a lot of lamina here. And if we look at greater detail, we see that we have 15 layers that can easily, even a lay man can analyze or can, can differentiate between these layers. And in these layers, we have all different types of cells and what is even more important, we have a clear layout of the input and output structures. And this is something that is much more, um, or much nicer than uh, in the mammalian counterpart in the superior colliculus, because in the bird, the, uh, and actually in all vertebrates, the um, input, the retinal input comes in via the top layers, goes down here, makes connectivity or makes connections here in the outer seven layers, and then it's relayed onto interneurons, and then finally to projection neurons that project on towards the tectofugal pathway towards the forebrain. And we know a lot about that system because this system, fortunately for us, in the chick, has been a model system for developmental studies. So we know a lot about the molecules, a lot about the gradient that you know, establish the, the visual maps and so on. And we also know a lot about the cell types in there because uh, numerous uh, studies have been done with both intracellular methods and Golgi methods, even going back to Ramon Cajal. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea of what the connectivity is like what the cell types are like, also what the molecules are like, and um, the real good thing about that system is that we pretty much know what it is doing, because what it is mainly doing is to construct a map of the sensory surround. <coughs> this is clear for the visual system, so any object in space will lead to a focus of excitation in that tactile space map. And it's also true for the auditory system, because a an auditory stimulus from that specific position in space will be computed and also lead to a focus of excitation in the space map. And they're actually bimodal neurons, and this is a pretty hot topic to understand how these two sensors are put together there. A lot is known about the, uh, well, the, the alignment of the maps. Eric Knudsen has done wonderful work on that in Barnholz, but uh, less is known about the actual bimodal integration on the level of the single neuron. Now it's true not only for um, the visual and the auditory system, but also for all other systems that you may happen to have. So if you're a rattlesnake, you also have infrared system and that is also projected onto that map and it's the lateral line, the somatosensory system, and so on and so on. And also, quite important, there is also a motor map. And that motor map is contained in the deeper layers. So the deeper layers receive information from that spatial excitation and then illicit orienting movements. So it's something that, well actually 40, 50 years ago was termed the uh, sensory reflex grasp, or sensory grasp reflex actually it was called. And it, it kind of, you know, explains quite nicely what the system is doing. Now a lot of work has been done on that um, subject. However, what I want to talk about today is something that is um, actually making the, the problem more, more complex. And this is, at any given situation, you are not only faced with one object, but what you have is you have a multitude of objects. And this multitude of objects will, oops, uh, oops, where is it? Yes. Will, of course, lead to many focus or many areas of excitation within the spatial uh, map. So the motor system now is faced with a problem how to pick up the most important 
object. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning. So what is the most important object? How can you pick up, how can you resolve at that level what the most important or the most salient object actually is? Because for the motor system, this excitatory map of the system is bad. Okay, you definitely need a disambiguated map. You need a clear excitation focus in order to make a clear <coughs> movement. Okay, the motor system cannot deal with you know multiple options. It needs one clear signal. All right. So this is the question that I'm going to tackle today, and um, a possible solution to that is a system that had been discovered well almost 100 years ago, but has received a lot of interest recently. And this is um, actually studied right now all over the world. Uh, Shurong Wang in Beijing was one of the first who started it. Uh, Juan Carlos Letelier, Gonzalo Marin, and Jorge Pedosis in Santiago. Um, Ralph Bessel, my colleague in St. Louis, and me, we have been studying that in Chicks, uh, Chicken. And uh, Eric Knudsen has uh, picked up that like eight years ago or so, working in the Barnau. Uh, but actually, most importantly, the founding father of it all, he was in Spain. And that was, again, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, actually, rather his brother, Pedro Ramon, who is usually neglected, but he was the one who did most of the non-mammalian stuff uh, that Ramon y Cajal then <coughs> publicized so well. And the part, this is actually um, the optic tectum of the bird, of the chicken. And the cells I'm going to talk about today are these. So these are two of the elements of the network that I'm going to present you. And uh, actually, this cell type is called the Shepherd's Crook cell type. It's not in relation to Gordon Shepherd, but it's <laughs> simply because the accent origin is like a shepherd's crook, like a Schäferstab for those <laughs> in German. Okay, so the good thing for us is that this network is contained in the slice preparation. So I'm mostly working in slices because it's a very convenient way of analyzing cells and you know, connectivity and stuff. So the good thing is that we do have the tactile layers, and then we have the isthmic nuclei here. This is the isthmic nuclei area. We have three of them, and the connectivity with these has been well worked out. And it's shown here, and I will walk you through in detail. So these are the tactile layers. These are the outer layers, the, tactile, the retinal afferents. These are the interneurons. And then here, this big layer, this is the projection neurons that project towards the telencephalon. Okay, and now, from the middle layer, you have this specific cell type, this is the, sh the, the shepherd's crook uh, shell type, and it projects to all the isthmic nuclei. And now you have several uh, motives of projection. First of all, you have the type where the shepherd's crook projects onto the nucleus, and from there, uh, projection goes back at exactly the same position where the input came from. This is a cholinergic feedback, there are two nuclei, the SLU and the IPC, the names doesn't matter, don't matter, but they go back to exactly the same position, homotopic, and project there with cholinergic afferents. Now you have the same cell type making output to another nucleus, which is the magnocellular nucleus, and this one is GABAergic. Now, from the GABAergic nucleus magnocellularis, you have two projections back to the tectum. One is a broad GABAergic <laughs> feedback, and that goes not to the area where the cell receives its input from, but actually spares this area. So it rather goes into the surround in this tactile space map. And then to make things a little bit more complicated, you have the second GABAergic cell type in the IMC that does not project back to the tectum, but projects to the other two nuclei, inhibiting those. Okay, this is the basic network. And, well, we started off uh, by uh, trying to understand what the connectivity is like, how the cell types look like, what the, you know, the synapses look like, but we have not really succeeded there, and what the physiology of the system is like. And um, this was the first approach that we did. The good thing, as I said again, um, the whole thing is contained in the slice preparation, so we have, not in the entire tectum, but at least some part, the entire connectivity uh, contained. So we can you know, go in, stimulate the retinal afferents, which is quite nice because we know that this kind of mimics input to the retina, okay? Like you know, a, an object, a moving object, whatever. And then we can stimulate, record, lesion, well, do whatever we, we, we want to do with the system and try to work out what is uh, actually going on here. The second approach is modeling, and this is something that I don't do myself, but I did it together with Ralph Bessel at the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and the third 
that we just recently picked up is to image that system with uh, voltage sensitive dyes to get a better understanding of what the network dynamics of the system are. Okay. I will just give a few examples of the data or the type of data that we have gathered so far and then come back and try to, well, wrap it up and, and uh, say something about the general function in the brain. Okay, now for the um, cell physiology, as I said in the slides, you can easily, well, patch onto the cells and record from the cells and, well, do whatever you want to. So this is the Shepherd's Crook cell type and you can see the axon here is depicted in red. And it's actually a very interesting cell type because the axonal origin up here, well, what does it mean for cellular computation in that cell type? It's actually a pretty interesting question, isn't it? So, and actually Ramon y Cajal already thought about that, and I will show you a picture of that in a few seconds. Okay, so what you can do, you can just, you know, record and, and get the cell parameters, and, well, you can give retinal input to the system. That was done here. This was a 500 microsecond long uh, stimulus to the retinal input layers, and you see that the cell starts off firing for several seconds. And that appears to be a network uh, uh, thing because you can actually hyperpolarize the cell in between and it resumes firing. So these are the types of data that you can gather in the system, and of course you can also get the, the latencies. Okay, stimulating up here, seeing how long does it take for a signal to come down to here, how long does it take from here to there, and so on and so on. So you get all the parameters that you actually know in order to model the system which is uh, membrane parameters, the neurotransmitters are known, and, well, the IF relation, the spontaneous activity, which is actually only here in the SLU, and the response latencies between all these different elements. And, uh, well, we did that, and at that time, then, Ralph Bessel took over and modeled the system, and uh, what we, uh, well, we were lucky because just a little bit earlier, there was work by the Chilean group, uh, Gonzalo Marin, uh, in 2007, and they showed something interesting. If you record from the isthmic system, from one of these nuclei in the isthmic system, these cells have receptive fields. Okay, so you record from the cell and it has a regular receptive field, which is down here, position one. So if you stimulate the cell by moving an object through that receptive field, what you see is you see this rhythmic bursting of the cell. Now this cell, receptive field, is just down here. It's not up here, but if you move another second stimulus through the, receptor, uh, through the other area up here. What happens is that the first response that, you know, to, to stimulus one is suddenly abolished and the cell goes into a high frequency firing mode which is quite different from what it did before. So the idea was, is that the effect of the isthmic network and can we re reproduce that if we put everything that we know about the network in a model? And this is what Ralph did, so we did a rather simple model which uh, contains the, um, the shepherd trick cells up here with the retinal ganglion cell input, the two different types of uh, GABAergic uh, magnocellular cells, and the feedback from the one cholinergic feedback nucleus, the other we did not put into that model. And uh, what we did is we, um, so this is the blue cell type here in layer 10 cells, these are the two GABAergic, and this is the IPC neuron. So we gave input at a specific position here. Okay, and after having done that, well, uh, when we do that, the system goes into a rhythmic feedback mode. But if we then introduce a second stimulus at another position here in the 300 simulated input layers, then we get a switch from activity at position one to position two. And that switch um, is exactly when we introduce the second stimulus, and the second stimulus uh, has to be stronger it has to have a specific strength in order to remove the reverberating excitation from the one locus to the other locus. Okay, and this we found in, in, um, in our network, and this is exactly what Eric Knudsen found just recently, or uh, actually it was 2010 or 9 even, I think, when he was looking at tactile neurons and looking at the response of neurons in the optic tectum and then having a distractor next to that receptive field of the cell he was recording from. And the distractor actually had, oops, well, the distractor actually had to have a specific strength, in that case a looming speed, in order to make something that he called a switch-like response in the tactile cell. So before, the cell would simply ignore that there is something else in the surround, but when the distractor had a specific strength, the cell would suddenly cease firing, okay? And that actually fits very well with everything that has been discussed in that system so far, so that there is in fact 
a system that is weighing all the different inputs that coming onto the tectum simultaneously and, well, you know, voting out the strongest stimulus in order to get a clear focus of excitation in the map. Okay, Eric has actually done quite a lot on that, but, uh, well, he, he published that recently in a series of excellent papers, so I don't uh, want to go into detail here. Well, what we try to do is to go beyond the single cell level, or actually to go beyond the physiological level and look at the network dynamics. And what we did, therefore, was to go in into the slice again with voltage-sensitive dice and simply first to see what the response of the network is like when we stimulate at a given retinal or tactile position um, with an electric stimulus, and we did that here. So this is the control situation. This is the situation with a GABA block. And, uh, well, the only thing that I want to show you here is just that, first of all, we can monitor the network activity in response to an input at a specific position. And second, that apparently the entire system is under a strong GABAergic block most of the time, which might not be that interesting. On the other hand, the same type of experiment has just recently been done by Vukun et al. in the rat superior colliculus, and there it looks exactly the same. So apparently, a strong GABAergic block, even in the slice, seems to be something that is uh, conserved between vertebrates. Now, of course, the, the question that we really want to answer is, what happens if we have two competing stimuli? <laughs> okay, and of course we did that, but of course we're not done. <laughs> so this is something that a student of mine has just been doing, and uh, he is currently just analyzing the data. We're just not done yet. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is it's much more complicated than we thought, not only to get you know, decent and reliable data, but also, uh, well, removing the isthmic nuclei does not have the strong effect that we thought it, should, it would have. Okay, so we are currently trying to make sense of that. It's, uh, there's another level to the story that apparently we are not grasping at the moment. Okay, well, this is, um, well, I can't tell you a lot about that, but uh, the other thing uh, that I want to, to uh, make a point of is that there is, even though somebody said that, well, you do not have to look at all the details. That's, of course, true, and you always have to try to, you know, get an understanding on a specific level. However, there are so many, I would say, devilish details that uh, at least I want to hint at some. So, for example, the feedback from the IPC to the tectum here, this synapse, this is one synapse. This is one terminal field from one IPC neuron. So that neuron has a very thick axon, that bifurcates and trifurcates and so on and so on and makes zillions of synaptic inputs in, well, probably not onto a specific target neuron, but rather into a cartridge, flooding that cartridge with acetylcholine. And how to model that and how to understand what this is actually doing, we have no clear idea. Well, the cells that do make these efferents, they look like this. And, well, I come also from the auditory system, and there, this is something that is often associated with um, coincidence detection because you have a bitufted dendrite, dendritic field, so you can you know, compute between inputs on the two different sides of the, of the neuron. Well, timing seems to be important in the system. Okay, so maybe, well, this is something to be uh, analyzed. And so on, and so on, and so on. <coughs> um, the shepherds crook cell, for example, is interesting. This is a drawing from Ramon Cajal, and he at that time, he was in possible, this guy, he actually speculated upon information flow from here to the axon down here. And the reason behind that is these might be the cells that actually um, combine auditory and visual information. And the visual information reaches the brain much, you know, later than the auditory information. So that might be a delay element in order to get coincidence detection here. Okay, which is interesting in its way, but, well... In order to study that and to go to the cellular level, we have uh, taken to um, transfection. And, uh, well, I won't go into detail. This is what we can achieve right now, but this is not the cell type that we want to work on. So we have to uh, improve our vectors uh, to, to get a, well, cell type specific transfection. And then we can try to um, look at these cells. Okay. Um, well, the mechanism is not restricted to the visual system. <clears throat> okay, the mechanism is not restricted to the visual system. It's not a visual subsystem. And in general, if one thing you should take home from this lecture, the optic tectum is not a visual system. The optic tectum is a multimodal system. It's only involved and only, you know, cares about spatial, spatial relation to the animal. Okay, it's not visual. It's dominated by vision, but it's not visual. Okay, so everything coming from there is multimodal. Okay, and the last point I want to make is, well, 
Um, these are all bottom-up things. So this is good if you walk around into a room or in, in, in the woods and have no idea what to look at. However, there are, of course, often situations where it's very important that you do not lose your focus. And in order to do that, you need to modulate these mechanisms, okay? And there's also a beautiful study from the Knudsen Group, and they have looked at another um, spatial map in the forebrain, the AGF map, and to make a long sh story short, if you stimulate in that AGF map, in the forebrain map, what happens is not that the animal is now attending that position, but what happens is that the tactile circuitry is now modulated in a way that the sensitivity of the cells at the corresponding locus is increased. Okay, and only if you stimulate in the forebrain very strongly, then you get a direct movement. Okay, so the idea is the forebrain is actually not overruling the circuitry, the forebrain is tuning the circuitry. And that, to me, makes a lot of sense because that is, you know, the midbrain, that's the old circuitry. And the forebrain was the, you know, circuitry discovered afterwards, uh, uh, developed afterwards. Okay, so that's, well, it, yes, it does apply to real animals as well. So it's also there in the mammals. It's been neglected a lot. It's the parabageminal nucleus and everything that has been studied so far is actually comparable. Uh, and this is the last thing I want to show you. So you do have a world, you do have topographic sensory input, uh, sensory input from the world. It's projected onto the optic tectum where you have a map formation. You have that system that actually does something like winner takes all, novelty preference, stimuli, uh, stimulus competition and stuff like that. And this system is then tuned by the forebrain in order to get a, well, most uh, survival appropriate response out of the system. Thanks for your patience. We can take one or two quick questions. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, what I want to ask is that uh, whether you found, of course, I'm sure you did find, but I didn't, um, I couldn't, you know, understand that aspect. If you found connections. You know, as you explained in the in the first few in the first few slides about how one tries to to identify the, the significant aspects in the environment, and I'm sure there is some very strong correlation with either memory or with you know emotions. Uh, so if there is a fearful stimuli versus a happier stimuli, so could you find uh, connections with the hypothalamus or with the you know amygdala back to the tectum and the midbrain? No, we haven't looked at that. And, and of course, I, what I do not want to, to uh, allude uh, to, to say is that this is like, you know, the major part of the story. I mean, it's just one automatically, uh, it's an automatic mechanism going on in a situation where the brain or the animal has no clear idea of what it is doing, of how to weigh information, and so on and so on. So this is just the, you know, automatic part of what the brain is doing. How emotions and so on are integrated here is definitely beyond what, what I can talk about. Because I'm sure, you know, experience will, of course, matter. The animal's ex uh, prior experience to, you know, a particular kind of stimuli. When I would see a, a wolf in, in an, you know, image, I should think of a wolf as being a dangerous uh, thing right. for me. And that is why I would, I, you know, I would identify it right. in the environment. Right. Versus the but other this is aspects. definitely not something that you would, you know, uh, um, uh, locate in that mechanism. So that mechanism, uh, that mechanism is kind of dumb. Okay. So this certainly has to involve cortical circuit. This certainly has to involve amygdala circuits, and so on and so on. This is not something that can be done with that system. Right. This is like I said, it's like the default situation. You have no clue what's going on, but you have to respond quickly. Okay. And responding quickly is what this system is capable of doing. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>